Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Councilors of Real Estate, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this session, What's Next for Real Estate and the Life Experience? The asset class is Business Unusual. Thank you for joining us. I'm Bill McCarthy, CRE Global Chair of the Councilors of Real Estate and President of WPJ McCarthy & Company in Burnby, British Columbia, Canada. The Councillors is a distinguished international group of accomplished advisors solving the world's real estate challenges. Experienced, innovative, and credentialed problem solvers, Councillors reside in 21 countries, practice in many more, and offer expertise in 60 real estate disciplines over all asset classes. Each has earned the prestigious CRE designation. I'd like to recognize our What's Next webinar series sponsors, Altus Group, Ustak Real Estate, Equus Capital Partners, and WPJ McCarthy. Thank you for your support. Before I begin, I'm pleased to offer you a free subscription to the Counselor's peer-reviewed professional journal, Real Estate Issues. If you don't already subscribe, please visit cre.org slash REI. You're encouraged to utilize the Q&A feature should you wish to submit a question. Your participation is welcomed and we'll answer as many questions as time allows. I'm privileged to introduce today's moderator, Victor Canelong, PhD, CRE. Victor is head of commercial real estate economics at Moody's Analytics. He is a fellow at the Wharton uh, School of University of Pennsylvania and sits on the Counselor's esteemed economic advisory council. Most of you know that Victor is a prolific speaker, writer, offering analysis and market data an um, analytics. He ex always explains in compelling manner how convergence of the three is impacting commercial real estate asset classes and the industry in general. Welcome to you all and welcome Victor. Well, thank you very much, Will, Larissa, all the organizers and attendees from the Councilors of Real Estate and our guests for having us today. It is the middle of May, and a lot, if not more hype, is swirling around commercial real estate, banks, the economy, and various sources of concern. When is the recession finally coming? How will it impact CRE? What is the real state of play with banks? How will a tense geopolitical situation unfold? There's just so much to digest, along with many new shows like Beef on Netflix and the upcoming Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary. How do we make sense of it all, particularly from the vantage point of what's next for CRE and everything connected and related to the built environment? Now, as Will mentioned, I'm an economist and I have to answer questions like these every day. In fact, actually, I have all the definitive answers. But today, I get to ask the questions. After all, our speakers today are at the front lines of CRE Capital Markets. What kind of deals are they doing and why? Where are they focusing financing or investment efforts? What gives them pause? With me today are my esteemed colleagues from industry, Emi Adachi, Director of North American Research and Co-Head of Global Research Operations at Hypeman, who's actually about to fly to ULI in Toronto, but delayed her flight for us, and Ryan Severino, Chief Economist and Head of U.S. Research for Bentle Green Oak and the most snazzy pocket square dresser <laughs> I know. Emmy, Ryan, thank you for being here. I am really excited to have this conversation with both of you. Emmy, let me pick on you first. And mm -hmm. maybe we start with the so-called good news, multifamily and industrial. Will these two sectors remain hot or not? Oh, early precursor of Facebook, mm -hmm. hot or not, through the cycle. What about the rise of alternative sectors? Tell me a little bit what's on your mind, Emmy. Sure. Thank you, Victor. Um, so thinking about multifamily and industrial, of course, two of the darlings of the last cycle and really have had a remarkable run for several years. Um, we are certainly seeing moderation in the fundamentals within those two property types, but I think we need to remember, of course, that they were operating at such 
incredible levels, um, just historically strong fundamentals for the most part. Uh, we've definitely seen demand soften in the multifamily area, and there is a tremendous amount of new construction coming online. So some concerns there, but again, occupancies remained high around 95%. Um, and uh, operations within portfolios like the one that Heitman's own, Heitman owns across the country um, are still very strong. Industrial also extremely strong still. We are seeing, again, moderation, but from historically high levels, um, very strong operations. Vacancy is only about 4% nationally, and we're still seeing really strong demand. So they're going to stay hot. They're certainly going to moderate. And I think this will be a really interesting downturn, um, in particular for industrial, because this will really test our thesis that industrial has um, really changed structurally, right? It's no longer a property sector that just follows the macro cycle um, and, and goes up and down with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but that it's truly driven by some new structural tailwinds like e-commerce growth and the focus on building resilient supply chains and nearshoring and onshoring. So um, again, I think it will be very interesting to see how it rides out this downturn. And then to the last part of your question, the alternatives obviously continue to rise. Um, certainly some of them are, are seeing some issues. You're seeing a little bit of softening in uh, data centers, life sciences. Um, but for the most part, you know, they continue to perform really well. And that's part of what we like about them is that the drivers of those sectors like self-storage and medical office and student and senior housing and single family rentals, they are less linked to or delinked from the macroeconomic cycle because they have different drivers. So I believe those are certainly going to be quite resilient um, through the coming downturn. All right. Thanks, Emmy. That's really kind of optimistic. So I mentioned through the cycle with you, Ryan, let me turn to you next. This might be the most forecasted recession ever. <laughs> and this might also be the most forecasted CRE crash ever. And yet we haven't really entered a recession, I think. And aside from a few deals that blew up that tend to make the news, the CRE crash really hasn't happened yet, at least systemically. What is your take of uh, the likelihood of a recession at this point? and the likelihood of a CRE crash, however you want to define it. Uh, well, first, thanks, uh, Victor, for having me uh, and everyone for, for being here. It, you know, it's funny, I, I joke around. I say, uh, if I knew exactly when the recession was coming, I wouldn't be working for BGO. BGO would be working for me. But what I would say is um, I'm still not in the camp that a, a technical recession is a foregone conclusion. I've been pretty consistent about that for the last year. Uh, there's still a lot of momentum in the economy. It's clearly slowing down, no doubt about it. And I'm not trying to be pedantic about this, but I, I think there's a probability that even if we have a technical contraction in the economy, it might not constitute a recession as the NBER defines it. If you remember, there were a couple of quarters during the last expansion phase of the business cycle where the economy contracted and wasn't deemed a recession. Uh, I don't think the two consecutive quarters last year of contraction in the economy are going to be deemed a recession. So I, I think there's a chance that the economy slows down and might even contract temporarily without it necessarily falling under the rubric of a, of a recession. So I'd put the odds at maybe 50-50 at this point. I haven't uh, run my model that recently, but that feels about right to me based on the last time uh, I ran it. As far as CRE goes, I, I feel like there's a lot of scaremongering out there on the part of experts like Elon Musk, who have an intimate understanding of the commercial real estate market. Um, I think there are issues out there, certainly. And I think everyone knows that of which I speak, the office market, particularly the lower uh, the lower caliber space that, that's functionally obsolete. But, but to Emmy's point, by and large, if you look across a lot of the commercial real estate space, things are slowing down as befits a pro-cyclical asset class like commercial real estate. But Things are not imploding. Uh, a slowdown and a, and a change coming off of what has been a, a pretty strong rebound up until recently over the last couple of years, to me, you know, doesn't constitute uh, or certainly, I think, befit a lot of the doom and gloom that's out there. So I think there are pockets of concern. I don't I don't want to discount them. Um, but the idea that that all of commercial real estate is imperiled and that it's going to be uh, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back and brings the economy down with it, that that feels overhyped to me at this juncture. 
Okay, thanks, Ryan. I am, however, 100% sure that there will be another recession at some point. At some point, the naysayers will be right. And then they're going to say, I told you so, even if they were like eight years late. Right. So, Emmy, just real quick, if we do run into a recession at some point and or cap rates finally rise systemically, will it? Are there contrarian opportunities that you see in sectors that will be hit relatively harder or perhaps they were hit hard during the pandemic, like office, retail or senior housing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would say that cap rates for all of the in favor sectors that we just mentioned that are doing really well, apartments, industrial, a lot of the alternatives, they have risen and that's simply a function of um, higher interest rates. They were at such amazingly low levels for so long um, that they had to rise, but that doesn't really reflect any fundamental weakness. Now we will see if, you know, if and when there is a recession, um, you know, if unemployment is rising, right, you see apartment demand, of course, start to come down. Um, you might see industrial, right, start to pull back as tenants don't need quite as much space. Uh, and some of the other asset classes will be affected. So you'll have your kind of normal cyclical variations in cap rates. Um, but what I think is interesting is when we think about the out of favor um, sectors. So something like retail, for instance, Right, open air retail, we all know, is the strongest segment of that property type, uh, especially grocery anchored open air retail. Uh, cap rates there are, they're, you know, they never got, they're not super high. It's not like a screaming deal to buy retail, um, but there are some opportunities in open air for sure. Malls are still, you know, generally something people don't want to touch. Senior housing was an interesting one because. It was beset for so many years before the pandemic by so much oversupply. And then, of course, the nature of the pandemic just hit it extremely hard. But it's in recovery mode. And that one's interesting to us now for the first time in several years because you're finally actually starting to see that that huge demographic wave that's been anticipated for so long um, as the baby boomers start to get older that's finally on the horizon. So senior housing could be an interesting one. And the cap rates there are pretty attractive at this point. And then finally on office, I would say that is, we'll talk more about it, I'm sure, but that is a long slog. It's going to be very, very tough. Uh, there could be occasional opportunities here or there over the near term, but I think it's gonna be a, a ways down the road before pricing has come down enough to make any of that really make for investors like us. Okay, thank you, Emmy. Uh, we've spoken about pricing and its variations. Ryan, can you comment about the other side of pricing, income drivers, rents, vacancies, expenses? What are you seeing from your vantage point? Where are the stresses and where are stresses not quite there yet, despite the media hype? Uh, clearly, we're seeing some issue on the top line with, I'm, I'm going to generalize a little bit, but broadly across the asset classes with you know upward pressure on vacancy, downward pressure on rent growth, you're seeing generally a slowdown in, in overall revenue growth, which you know befits a slowdown in the economic cycle. Uh, the expenses side, in some categories, there's been some relief there, but that's where I, I'm, I'm, I will say I'm, I'm objectively interested to see how this plays out. We're still seeing a lot of uh, the services professions that business wages there are holding up because it's, it's relatively difficult to get that kind of labor right now. That, that is where the labor shortage is probably the most, most acute in the country right now. And the, the part that I'm, I'm really interested in, but I just don't know yet, is what municipalities are going to do with property taxes over the next few years, especially if the office sector, is, as, as Emmy said, is going to go through a relatively long, uh, let's call it a transformation. I'll be a little euphemistic about it. A relatively long transformation. It's and evolving. That, it's evolving. Yeah, yes. And I, I, and I don't honestly know. I, there's a lot of chatter about that right now. I've heard from um, people in different parts of the country with, with their, their views on it and, and some things that are taking place. But that's one where I, I just don't know enough yet on a widespread basis. And I'm not sure the municipalities themselves know enough yet on a widespread basis. So I'd say keep an eye out for that because um, commercial real estate's an easy target. It's nameless, it's faceless. It doesn't vote the way residential real estate effectively votes. So it's, it's easier to go after than it is to go after residential property owners. 
Okay, Emmy, following off Ryan's comments on income drivers, I know you've hinted a little bit at this. Let's talk about pricing drivers. How much repricing have we really seen thus far in the various property sectors? And how much more might we, ex where's the action happening? Because transaction volumes kind of like dried up. So I'm like, what, what, are, what are you seeing from your vantage point? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that um, we're looking, obviously, at what's happening in the market, what little we can glean. Um, there are, you know, a few transactions here and there, very little, um, you know, whether we're getting appraisals or BOVs. But again, a lot of that is backwards looking. So we have certainly also been looking at things like the, the Green Street CPPI, the commercial price, uh, commercial property price index is pretty good because that really aims to be more real time less you know looking back at transactions uh, I, I know i know i know how that sausage is made and you okay yeah anyway, anyway we'll talk that. about that okay we should, yes, yep. Yep. um so i think right now they've got the average for commercial real estate values being down about 15 percent across the board which to us sounds about right so if you look at something like odyssey right or the nacreef index you're down now i think about 10 percent over the last couple of quarters and we expect you know it, it tends to come down gradually over a period of time so i think we expect that those values will get written down a bit more you know a little bit more uh, but of course there's huge variation brought by property type so thus far we've seen very little um, devaluation in sectors like single family rentals uh, many of the niche residential categories and many of the the ones that are still operating with very strong fundamentals and then of course you have seen um, office take the biggest hit i think green street's latest number on office was in the mid to high 20 percent range which could be about right on average but as we know there there is likely a lot more to come for those those buildings that Ryan mentioned that are obsolete they're commodity buildings you know from the 1980s or 90s or even early 2000s they are just not uh, attractive to tenants today and they're very very expensive to just both operate and lease up and to try to reposition so i expect uh, a lot of value decline to come uh, for those assets ahead got it thanks emmy so you're saying you're on the lookout for good deals I will be. Always yes. Once, yes. You always right. are. Oh, yeah, always. Once those values are written down, because I will say uh, one interesting example would be um, Northern Virginia, right, where the office market there has struggled for years. So values were written down over time and they got low enough to the point where it made sense for developers to come in and do some office to residential conversions there. Um, so that's a really interesting play, of course, right? Because there's need for more residential, less suburban office. Um, but again, the pricing just has to be at appropriate levels. Got it. Thanks, Emmy. Ryan, let's talk about capital markets. Obviously, banks are in the crosshairs, given what happened to SVB and a bunch of others. CRE is now being presented as higher risk. Lending is likely to tighten. But even before SVB, there was talk of equity having to come in to plug holes from debt pulling back and values going down with the whole LTV equation. Is there a play here for equity investors to take advantage of capital market disruptions? I certainly think so, uh, given the seat that I sit in now. But I, what I would say is, uh, you know, we're still active, you know, running investment committee, looking at deals, kicking the tires. I think there are, you know, to Emmy's point, I, I still think there are some shoes to drop here. But I think there is a clear role for equity to play in this, whether it's uh, whether it's a, a straight up acquisition, whether it's some kind of recapitalization, even playing in that kind of uh, I'll call it the gray area of the capital stack between pure equity and pure debt, where you have those hybrid investments. I, I think there are tremendous opportunities there. And I I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm um, an unabashed cheerleader for for shadow banking per se, but it it fills an important void that gets left when traditional lenders like banks become more circumspect and pull back during an environment like this. So for whatever um, terrible things, some people out, not on this call, obviously, but uh, out in the wider world might think about shadow banking and, and some of the aspersions that get cast uh, against it. I, I think you know that kind of uh, diversification of, of 
the capital stack and, and capital sources. Uh, I, that's where I think um, equity shops can play a more important role than just you know being the traditional equity provider. And I think you've seen that over the last, uh, certainly over you know the duration of my career, which is longer than I usually admit in polite company, uh, you've clearly seen uh, equity providers become more diversified sources of capital than just the straight up equity play. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for that over over you know the next phase of the business cycle. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Now, when they marketed our event, it did say real estate and the life experience. And so I would like to take a step back, talk about fundamental demand and supply drivers, maybe beyond that, which we directly observe in the built environment. Emmy, even if the World Health Organization formally declared that COVID is no longer a pandemic about a week, two weeks ago, we do know that its effects are still around. My aunt is literally nine days into a fever right now back in Asia. So fingers crossed that she's over that. But which as pertains to just COVID, the pandemic, recent periods, I mean, do you have a <laughs> sense of how lasting COVID era, say domestic migration that favored Sunbelt and smaller metro areas of how long, how, how, how lasting have those been? There are articles about Boise, Idaho on the resi front being a Zoom town. And now it's a bit of like a boom in a bus town when it comes to home prices. Thoughts on these places, exurban, rural areas, people's decision making and how it's changed because of the mm -hmm. pandemic or not? Yes, absolutely. It's a, a really interesting topic and one that I spend a lot of time uh, researching. So there are a lot of factors to consider here. So as you mentioned, the pandemic is, even if it's officially kind of over as an emergency, we know that um, the effects aren't fully played out yet. We still have to see where things settle. You know, the future of cities and downtowns is still a topic of debate. Um, and then add on to that the fact that the, the data lag quite a bit, right? So we're not going to have the real population data, the net migration data that we rely on for the full kind of last few years pandemic period for a while. Um, so in the meantime, of course, everybody's trying to find alternate data sources that are more real time. And we're looking at cell phone data and foot traffic and change of address and all of that. And we can also glean insights from our portfolio and how our different types of apartment assets or self-storage. Um, you know, what do they tell us about where people are moving? So we know that during um, the COVID period, there was an acceleration of a trend that was already in place, right? Which was a lot of people leaving very expensive coastal gateway markets and moving to more affordable Sunbelt cities, the Nashvilles and Austins of the world that are kind of the poster children of, of this trend. Um, you know, there are a lot of drivers there, but affordability is just one of the major trends, of course, right? There's been a lot of job growth there, but uh, you can, you know, you could buy a house for a lot less in Austin than you could in the Bay Area. And that's why we saw so much of that movement of, of tech workers and employers um, to places like that. But now, right, we're seeing the limits of some of those trends because suddenly that affordability gap that was so attractive has narrowed considerably. And then to your point about Boise, right, these even smaller markets, these tertiary markets that suddenly saw a flood of people coming in and those pushed up home prices and rent so much. Uh, at some point, there's a limit, right, to just how much these smaller metros can absorb. We're seeing a ton of new supply, right? Nashville and Austin, again, the, the amount of apartment supply is just staggering. And then you start to have bigger city problems, right? Because you need to fund the infrastructure. You have crazy amounts of congestion there. You know, do you have the schools in place? You're seeing places in Phoenix where the sprawl, the development, right, in the exurban and fringe areas, people can't get water now to these housing developments. So there are a ton of issues there that are likely to slow that growth to the Sun Belt. And so what we like to think about um, in my research team is then where does some of that growth go, right? Some people end up staying. Um, some people end up moving to cities that are adjacent to those expensive coastal markets, right? So places like Tacoma benefited a lot because Seattle is so expensive. Um, but also we, we wonder about what we call next cities, which is, you know, maybe people, maybe they can't move to Nashville or Austin or Raleigh 
or Florida, you know, metros anymore, but maybe they'll look at Columbus or Indianapolis, right? They're not as sexy or exciting, but they offer a lot of the same attributes. So I think it's really going to be interesting to see, you know, where these patterns go. I think they will persist to some extent, but they're not going to be as extreme. And then the return to the city is another one, right? That we're already seeing evidence of in many places. Um, but but many cities, especially out west, are still struggling for sure. Downtown areas will take a while to rebound. Okay, thanks, Emmy. Ryan, let me turn to you. The title of this event is Business Unusual. What do decision makers in the commercial real estate financing and investment space or development space, who cares? Well, if you're a stakeholder in commercial real estate, what do you need to prepare for given all the uncertainties in the market? If you were to share one or two things that should probably be done, not business as usual, but unusually, what might these be? This is going to sound a little bit idealistic, especially coming Don't from tell me, me chat GPT. Is it going to be chat GPT? <laughs> no. no. All right, go ahead. But I would say we're we're at a juncture right now, especially when you think about, about all of these things that are, are percolating below the surface, whether it's nascent banking issues, whether it's whatever the federal government's going to do with the debt ceiling. At the same time, we're in some kind of slowdown, let's call it. Uh, and we see it both in, in the macro economy and commercial real estate. What I would say is it's not the worst idea for parties, counterparties to transactions to not view the counterparty as quite the opposition that we've seen in the past. So here's a good example of that um, to a point that we've at least discussed a bit, if not, if not, uh, uh, you know, certainly alluded to on this call. We know there are office issues out there. It, it might be a better idea for landlords and tenants to not view each other in quite the oppositional terms as they have in the past, right? I understand landlords are trying to extract as much rent as they can to, you know, to make money. I understand that the tenants are really trying to do the opposite of that. But in a world where we know that these are fairly structural issues, it, you know, working together in some ways might be a better path than just being completely oppositional, you know, risking losing a tenant for whatever reason, um, or, or someone just deciding not to re-sign a lease and, and vacate a space altogether, uh, there, there might be a better middle path than just approaching it in such confrontational terms the way that uh, we might have once upon a time. So again, I'm not trying to be idealistic about this. I understand both sides have economic agendas and incentives, but uh, certainly in some parts of the market, and I hate to say this because it violates my favorite maxim for commercial real estate, but uh, it's it's really different this time, and we're not putting the genie back in the bottle. So you might want to approach those negotiations differently than you have in the past because uh, we are in a different world than we were in 10, 20, 30 years ago. Thanks very much, Ryan. E Emmy, I'd love your thoughts on a similar topic, but framed a little differently. We tend to do certain things in our respective businesses, in your case, investment management, if you could wave a magic wand and say you were going to restructure the way you did your things, or maybe you took on a different job, wish for something in the business world would start doing that it isn't currently doing, what would that be? Maybe it's something that you wish the business would stop doing, just to keep on the theme of usual versus mm -hmm. unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say that we, you know, commercial real estate can be a little bit slow to pick up on some of these new trends. And we know that the way people live and work and consume and play, those have been changing, you know, for many years. You have um, technology changing things, you have just different generations, right, and their preferences and the way they do things, changing things. And real estate needs to keep up with those trends, They, right, because that's what real estate is about, right? You're, these are the structures in which people live out their lives and they work and it's how the economy works. Um, and so... I think we need to be more flexible in our thinking and we need to break out of some of the traditional frameworks, right? So one of the things I've thought about a lot is that so much of our thinking when we, we look at markets is based on the old framework of commercial office 
right, being the kind of cornerstone of portfolios. And as we know, that has completely shifted. And when we view commercial office as the lens through which we look at all real estate, that changes the kinds of markets that you're open to. Um, if you really start to think about it in more of a people-centric way, right? Think about where do people want to live now? Where are they moving to? A lot of the, the um, hot property sectors, they're all driven by demographics or by movement of people. So then that should open you up to a whole new set of types of markets or submarkets that you'll consider. We've seen this start uh, within the business, but I think we need to continue with that. And then finally, on that same kind of point, Right, the, the old ideas about just property sectors and you had the four primaries and then you've got some of these, you know, we used to call them specialty or niche and now we call them alternatives. Um, but there's so much more convergence and blurring of the lines there. So single family rentals, right, is kind of treated as a different asset class, but there's so much convergence there with conventional multifamily. And now you're starting to see, you know, build to rent communities and horizontal multifamily as it's called. And, and so we need to, again, be flexible in our thinking. How do we categorize those, you know, within the NACREF index? How do we think about them? Um, and how do we just capture the emergence of all of these kind of niche sectors and subsectors um, in our strategies, as well as this whole new world of different geographies and markets that we should be investing in? Okay, thanks, Emmy. I recognize at least a couple of uh, pop culture references there. Blurred Lines, I think, like the Robin <laughs> Thicke song from 10 years ago. <laughs> And I think that's a whole new world reference could be a Disney thing, but I'm not sure. <laughs> that's a great point. One of my bugaboos okay. about real estate in general is that accounting tends to classify it as fixed assets, right? On the bottom <laughs> left-hand side of the balance sheet. But it really isn't a fixed asset. It really does evolve over time. You know, uses and it, 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 it's, I think it's endlessly fascinating. We can talk about this forever, but let's just go into lightning round before we turn it over to any questions that might have come in. Ryan, I'll start with you first. Then, Emmy, just a quick one sentence answers, okay? Lightning round. Ryan and Emmy, I know you can talk, each of you can like take up the entire hour by yourselves. <laughs> and so can I. So, one sentence answers, please. Literal lightning round. Ryan, go first. Boilerplate interview question. What keeps you up at night? Uh, aside from my kids, the uh, the risk that we might shoot ourselves in the foot in the economy, that we might be, uh, we, we've seen the enemy and it's us. You mean from just a policy point of view? From policy just... point of view, from banking irresponsibility, like we we are we are making problems Death for ourselves. Debt ceiling discussions, uh, yeah. all that fun stuff. We're creating problems that otherwise wouldn't have arisen uh, aside from our own doing, unfortunately. Okay. Emmy, what about you? What keeps you up at night? I would say housing um, and the fact that we have a glut of supply in some segments of the market and some locations, yet we have such a dire shortage of affordable housing in particular, that really concerns me. Got it. All right. Thanks very much. Emmy, let's start with you now. What should the Fed and policymakers <laughs> just put to bed right now that would make you feel, if they did something that would make you feel instantly better, what would that be? If we could just get clarity, right, on what's going to happen on, are they done with rate hikes? Are, you know, interest rates, how long are they going to stay elevated? I understand the Fed has to continue monitoring all of these factors, including inflation, but that's why the markets are frozen, right? That's why participants don't feel comfortable acting. And once we have some clarity, then we can at least know how to underwrite and how to adjust, and then things can start moving again. All right, Ryan, what about you? Yeah, I totally agree. We we don't need to be at the end of the tunnel, but we need to know how long the tunnel is. And I, and even with their most recent meeting, they didn't quite do that because they still left the door open potentially possibly maybe for more rate hikes. So, I think, you know, nobody wants to catch a falling knife. If we just had some semblance of of an idea of when this might come and then we can have a little bit of price discovery and stability i think it would be good for everyone but i'm then, not sure we're there yet yeah, and then again to be fair for those folks who are listening and who know the real challenge of being the fed at this point they're caught between a rock and a hard place right the whole point of policy is to make sure you're vague enough so that the market does not anticipate your moves and yet at this point because we basically put a cape on the fed 
and expect them to rescue everything from a puppy in a tree in a falling stock market to keeping employment full and inflation down, right? You, we kind of need clarity. And so it's a really tough job. And I'm not sure any of us here in this call would really want to be Jay Powell at this point, right? It's just a tough yeah. job. Ryan, let's start with you. Uh, lightning round. You're on the buy side equity business now. What if I magically transformed you into a lender? What opportunity would you go for or where? I still like the coastal gateway markets. I think they have to go through a transformation. They have to continue to evolve, but I'm not subscribing to uh, the thesis that they're going to become black holes of doom. If that were the case, it would have massively negative consequences for the national economy, the global economy. It'll take some time for them to figure it out, but we always figure it out eventually. Like Demi's point, you know, we're, we're always late to the party in commercial real estate, not five minutes fashionably late. We show up after all the punch is gone and the cool kids have moved on to the after party, but we do eventually figure it out. Uh, I still am a believer there. And uh, for the right project, I would still lend for uh, some of those really good core gateway markets. I, I, I think they're going to reinvent themselves and, and be different, but not worse. Emmy, what about you? What if it's like a, a, a shift in your career and you're like, you know what? I'm done with participating <laughs> in the upside. I really just want to lend and get paid back. What if you were suddenly a CRE lender? How would you answer that question? I would say there's a lot of opportunity when, right, when the whole sector, the whole market gets painted with a broad brush and lending is pulled back because, as we talked about, there's still some very, very strong fundamentals in a lot of sectors. So I would look at things like um, there are areas, trade areas, um, where self-storage development still makes sense. It's a little difficult to get construction financing these days, but there are areas that are undersaturated um, and there's tremendous demand. So if you can be a sharpshooter and find those, those particular pockets, they might be true in, in certain industrial submarkets for sure. Um, then I think you could see, see some very attractive opportunities. Okay, fantastic. This is really my last question for you folks, because we have a bunch of questions in the platform. So we tend to be US focused, but BGO and Hypeman, you guys operate globally. Is there a country or asset type outside the US that isn't getting a lot of attention? But should? Emmy, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I would, um, I would point to something like self-storage in Europe or alternatives broadly in Europe, because they are um, kind of in the early stages. They're just developing and they're developed enough to make them interesting, but you can still ride the wave of maturation that we've already seen occur in the US. So I think there's tremendous upside there. Now you think the Europeans hoard as much stuff as we do? <laughs> <laughs> they don't hoard as much, that's for sure. But a lot of um, homes, right, and apartments are smaller there. So there is really still a need. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Denmark, I have family in Denmark. I know you looked at me and went, of course, Victor Scandinavia. <laughs> uh, and you're right. It's just tremendously egalitarian, pretty small apartments, really mm -hmm. small cars. And you're right. I think there might be a point there to what you're saying. <laughs> what about you, Ryan? What's the next opportunity? Japan, right? Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> No? So leave my personal biases out of this. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, I would say data centers, not just because uh, you know th that's where the world is going, but in the U.S. we tend to have a very U.S. centric view of technology in the world. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on around the world, and, and I don't mean just U.S. China and the, the the tension there, but there's this increased balkanization of technology around the world. Just to give you an example, think about the difference in sort of uh, data privacy rights and, and bill of rights between say the eu and the united states you know that creates opportunities because that data is, you know they're not going to trust uh the united states government and united states corporations exclusively but the united so states are... trusts so many apps <laughs> from other countries yes yeah. right like especially when we're you know calling TikTok evil and leaks come out about all the stuff that we're doing, you know, who we're spying on and things like that. Balkanization is a good way to think about this. So it's not just that the US and China are, are you know, sort of putting up these, these digital firewalls and, and, and Chinese walls and staying behind them. It's that I think that's happening in the rest of the world because there is not a meeting of the minds on a lot of uh, what, you know, who, who owns the data, who has the rights to the data, what kind of privacy you're entitled to. Uh, that is is diverging more than it's converging right now. Okay, thank you very much. So that's it for our lightning round. I promised that we'd leave time for Q&A and there's a bunch on the platform already. 
from Diane Crocker. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not supposed to say the name. Uh, Will, do you want to lead the? Yeah, the I'll, I'll, I'll throw right, the ahead. questions at you so you can all focus on answering. And, and again, that's right. the whole session. I'm, I'm just teasing Diane just yeah. because I know her. But go ahead. <laughs> the whole session, Victor, Emmy, and, and Ryan was a lightning round, just a tremendous amount of information, and we all appreciate that. Quick question, um, Emmy, you mentioned about how nice it would be to have some clarity or certainty coming out of the regulators um, about rates, uh, inflation, and policy. And and Ryan, you also alluded to the fact that, you know, it's very hard to forecast or, or project when we have such mixed messages and no clarity. What can we as CRE um, experts, or at least hopefully influencers, do maybe to elevate the game in terms of public policy with regards to rates and, and just general fundamentals, which seem to be lacking more and more from real estate uh, issues. Emmy, you want to go first? Uh, I might need a minute to think about it. Anybody want to jump in? I'd say from my point of view, I, I don't think this is going to sound uh, almost impossible, but I don't think it's a, it, it's a part of the economy that's really well understood by people who aren't in the industry. I think the average person, if you've ever seen the movie Big, Right. There's a scene where they're playing with with toys at a toy company. And uh, one guy says, Tom Hanks says, like, it, it, it's a robot that turns into a building. What's fun about playing with a building? And I think the average person thinks about commercial real estate that way. Yet, you know, in times like this, when it seems like things are going off the rails, then all of a sudden it's public enemy number one. And I think that we could probably do a better job uh, as an industry educating you know policymakers whether it's monetary policymakers whether it's your fiscal policymakers whatever the case happens to be i think the average person perceives it as this very basic dull asset class but to victor's point it's constantly evolving and changing in ways that the that people outside the industry don't understand and and have a good handle of i think as an industry broadly and and as counselors we could we could do a much better job of that and i think for me to just chime in well same point with ryan part of it is simply just the paucity i know it's it's like data is being commoditized and yet it's actually incredibly hard to size the commercial real estate market certainly both debt and equity right i mean i think the pwc uli publication like every year or so that big door stopper of a book that andy warren would like put together they had an estimate of the total size of us both debt and equity from various sources but my estimate is that about 70% of a lot of commercial real estate equity flows is still via private markets in which case well how do you value that right in which case if we don't have that kind of transparency or even an agreement about how large the market is, behavior in X, Y, and, and by the way, that's, a, that's, that's an opportunity too, right? But it, it also just bolsters Ryan's point about how, how do we expect the average person to understand, right? So what about you, Emmy? I would say to Ryan's point that we, again, about the shift in thinking, you know, instead of just thinking about them as structures that we were trying to lease out space and we're just trying to collect, you know, the rent, think about them as solutions for people and businesses, right? How do we meet the changing needs of people? How do we create healthy buildings, right? Because people spend a lot of time in office buildings and apartment buildings. Um, how do we create healthy communities, right? So really thinking of it in a more holistic way rather than um, just, again, these structures where we're trying to lease out pieces of them and, and we don't really care about you know, what goes on inside. I think there's a shift occurring there, but we could certainly do a better job of that. And that's also would tie into this idea that our industry um, could potentially help you know address the housing affordability crisis right if we can really band together and put our capital to work in a smart way and speak out on a similar vein should we be worried or not about one something that used to be quite fundamental and that is the debt ceiling um some people based on from where they are say no big deal others say it's the end of the world and then there's also those who talk about possibly defaulting? Um, are we scaremongering? What's your view on the debt ceiling debate and how do you see this unfolding? Emmy, Ryan? I'll leave that to you too. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to touch that. Do you want to go first, Victor? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I tend to be a little cynical about this just because I've seen it. I've seen the kabuki play happen very often. Every time these things happen, it's going to be a performative discussion where legislators appeal to their voter bases. Oh, we are protecting your, your stakes and we're just going to be uh, you know, tough with X, Y, and Z. And then guess what? They have to approve a budget for stuff we've already spent, right? And so I think that this whole, we might even actually default internally. We stop paying some of our state, you know, uh, employees. But external default of debt, I think, is a historically unprecedented event that I don't think the United States wants to go there. Let's see whether or not our legislators actually take us over the cliff this time around. I've just seen the whole, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, a whole lot of media play. And then we get it approved anyway. And then we spend more next year. Ryan, what do you think? Yeah, it, it feels very performative to me. I would just simply say, I don't want to find out. I really don't want to find out because I, without we don't know exactly what would go would happen because to Victor's point, it's somewhat unprecedented. But the best models in the world all pretty much agree that that it would look pretty ugly. And so I would just say, if we're going to to score points politically, let's try to do it in some other place that's not potentially catastrophically bad for the U.S. and global economy because. Uh, we don't know exactly how bad it could get, but the downsides could be pretty severe. So let's let's find another way to throw sand at each other in the sandbox without uh, without a lot of collateral damage. I think there are analytical scenarios available now trying to model that, but just know that it's historically unprecedented, right? It's just never happened before. And the scale of the U.S. economy, given it's 25% of the global economy, the dollar is your reserve currency. And you cannot like say, ah, well, Argentina defaulted. Let's take yeah. a look at that experience. No, 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 no. I get asked about this internal. Oh, my gosh. Are your commercial real estate forecasting models calibrated for the probability of a debt default by the U.S.? And my answer is no. <laughs> there is no data. We can be smart about it. But they're really, it's all a swag at this. We can be smart about it. We're not going to give that up. But really, it, to, to Ryan's point, I don't think we want to happen. I, I don't think we want to find out what happens. Mm -hmm. Yep. One more short policy que question, just a small one. Is there a possibility? And if so, what would be the consequences if the US dollar lost its reserve uh, rank? Because we're going to Bitcoin now? Ryan, what do you think? Just the U.S. as the reserve currency for the world for many generations now. Is there a possibility that could go away? This is another one that I think is overhyped in reality. There, there isn't a viable alternative to that. And I think there's going to be a viable alternative to that. Yes, I understand that that more global trade is being conducted in other currencies. And, and I understand that. And, and we're also seeing global trade and distribution become kind of factionalized depending upon your... Um, particular form of governance and your view of uh, the power of the people in different parts of the world. But the idea that something is going to usurp the dollar as the reserve currency, I, it's just, there isn't a good alternative, right? Like it, it's like Tina, there is no alternative, right? For a while people thought, oh, maybe it's going to be the yen, but that didn't turn out to be the case. And then they thought it would be the Euro and that clearly didn't turn out to be the case. And now some people are thinking about the Yuan, but if, if you're going to have autocratic centralized control over very important parts of the economy, then a lot of people are not going to be okay with leaving a lot of their reserves in, in a currency like that. So could it happen at some point to Victor's point? Sure, down the road, just like there'll be another recession, maybe there will be a viable competitor. But at any kind of reasonable time horizon, somebody needs to show me the alternative because I just don't see it when I look at the, the other viable competitors in the world right now. It's just It's just not possible. With that said, as a quick caveat, the U.S. does get away with a whole lot of things because the dollar is the reserve currency, right? I don't think there's any other country in the world that can run a trade deficit in the nine to 10 figures and not have its currency depreciate or have the market punish it in that way. This is exactly what happened to the currency crisis in Asia in 1997. People started wondering whether they could actually pay their debt. And then the traders just hit them because they didn't believe that to be the case and their currencies depreciated. I know this 
was very painful for me because I was going to grad school 25 years ago and suddenly the Philippine peso went from 25 bucks to the US dollar to 40 pesos per US dollar. It really hurt. So the US gets away with a whole lot because of that. And on the other hand, is it really a good strategy for the US to keep raising its debt limit? And because we're still on a risk adjusted basis, pretty much the default investment for a lot of world capital. And if that, if you're right, to, 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 to Ryan's point, if the dollar does lose that seat, I wonder what that does to incentives for the US to manage its fiscal and monetary policy a bit differently. Back to you, Will. Another question regarding the, the spike in interest rates, which has been so dramatic. And we used, say, four-point raise over the last uh, year and a bit. What would the dialogue be or what would you encourage if you were either representing a lender or a borrower? Say the person has a very good building, you know, a good client, a good um, reputation and track record with the lender. But now that they're, um, the interest rates have gone up so high uh, and they have a note coming up, what degree of cooperation do you see there will be between some lenders and some uh, owners of property right now when they're looking to try to make their DCR ratios, which are challenged right now? Ryan, you kind of addressed some of that earlier, right? Just about like working together, but maybe you can share. Yeah, more. no. And I, and I think you're, you're seeing some of that at the margin, at least. I don't think it's a paradigm shift in the way that borrowers and lenders are interfacing with each other, but, but certainly uh, there were some, ex there were good examples of that during the last cycle coming out of the global financial crisis, where I think borrowers and lenders figured it out. Uh, I would say in this cycle, particularly in those parts of the market where it's going to be a challenge, uh, it's in their best interest to do that, right? Lenders don't want to go REO on this stuff. They re that's not the business that they're in. They don't, they don't really want to do that. So I would say to the extent that they can figure out a way to not do that, even if it's uh, you know a, a less than ideal scenario, something suboptimal might be a better course of action. So I think that dovetails perfectly with with uh, the point that I made earlier. I think that there are middle paths to this that are not as as ruthless as they they might have been in, in a different time in a different cycle. Emmy, did you want to share a few things? Yeah, I would just echo that from our own experience on both sides of, of these kinds of uh, situations where do you really want the keys back to a, a struggling office building? Um, you know, the answer is typically no. So certainly there are incentives to to work something out. And, and for the most part, that's what I'm seeing so far. We are hearing about a few distressed sales, but as we try to just get through this period of uncertainty, it, it tends to be better to, to try to find some sort of a bridge solution, uh, go back to pretend and extend perhaps. Yeah. Or extend and pretend, sorry. <laughs> Rolling loan gathers no loss, something like that. <laughs> Is that the cliche? Victor and one of our... Will, we're not, Victor, we're not in hearing... Victor, one of our um, planning yeah. sessions for this, you commented, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, oh. I can hear you. You, okay, you, you kind of froze a little bit, and I was yeah. wondering if you went Drax the Destroyer and just like really stayed still and looked practically invisible. No, if you can, can okay. you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm zooming from North Vancouver Island, uh, so it's a wonder of technology. Oh my, where is that even? Is that in North America? North, yeah, it's in British Columbia. Okay, <laughs> I'm just I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> go, go ahead, go ahead. Everybody, come to Vancouver for our conference, and I'll show you on a map, Victor, where Vancouver Island is, twelfth largest <laughs> island on Earth. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, just a question. You you mentioned in one of our planning sessions that um, there's been a lot of. Uh, items written about the volatility or not of small regional banks. And I guess for want of a better term, that might be well overplayed. Do you want to comment on that briefly? Yeah, I just got to say, you know, there was a statistic that was being bandied around that 80% of all CRE loans are held by smaller banks. And let me tell you, just take a look at Fed flow of funds data. It literally shows you that along with CMBS, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Life Goes, and so on and so forth, banks probably have about 50% of the total lending pie on their books. So how could smaller banks own 80% of the debt if all banks have only 50? That's really fuzzy math. And I think when we finally did the math, it turns out that's closer to around 13 to 29%, depending on how small the bank is, you know, a billion dollars to $160 billion. So 
I'd say at a time like this, it is super easy to get carried away with panic and nuance goes out the window. And I think part of my fun and wanting to have this conversation with Emmy and Ryan, who I can talk to all day and you will, is guys, this is exactly the time that we should be talking more and analyzing stuff better. Because that, in my mind, is the anti one antidote to panic, right? I, it's just it's just really wrong numbers. And I think there was one Moody spot, not my group, of course, really literally re regurgitated that number. And I said, dudes, like, stop that. Stop. Right? Stop. That's wrong. And so let's be nuanced. And let's keep talking. That's I'm not saying that there are no risks out there. But we can, we it can and should be smart about it. Back to you, Will. Good points. Um, the seminars, the webinars are entitled The Life Experience. So the question about um, hybrid working, either from home, office, combination thereof, how big an impact do you see that? Is that, is that the trend that we will be hybrid? And then I guess, of course, the question follows is, what percent of people are going to be allowed to work um, hybrid or from home? And of course, the bigger social economic question is, What's going to be the impact on cities and downtowns where people aren't working there the way they used to? Everybody from the mom and pa sandwich shop to the fitness center to the property tax bill that the cities count on. Um, just a general comment, uh, any way you want to take it um, with regards to the uh, work workplace of the future, that hybrid model. Emmy, I feel like you have not thought about this at all. <laughs> right. <So yeah>. maybe <laughs> I'm catching me by surprise. A few um, thoughts you might want to share. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we could talk about this for an hour. And obviously, you know, we continue to track things like just the survey data, right? What are the employers versus the employees want? And who's got the leverage in the labor market at the time, right? So obviously for a long time, it was um, definitely on the side of the employees. Uh, now you're seeing some of that shift back, right? And you're seeing tech layoffs. So maybe people are starting to come back into the office a little bit more than they used to. But we do know that hybrid working broadly is here to stay. It was already, you know, kind of happening before the, the pandemic, but clearly accelerated and enhanced. But at the same time, you know, it, it's not as simple an equation as saying, okay, people are going to work in the office three days a week and at home too. So then therefore you could cut down your space needs by 40%, right? That's not how it works because the whole point of being in the office is to collaborate and do certain activities that you can't do well at home. We know that you can do certain things very productively from home and other things you need to be with your coworkers and, and meet your clients and all of that. So again, I think what we're seeing is it's just a shift in the type of space. Um, overall, there certainly we've seen a net reduction in space demand. Uh, I'd say maybe right now, a lot of the forecasts or estimates are saying it's going to be around 15%. Um, so there, there's definitely a negative impact. Um, but you know, again, we, we have to see how it all shakes out over time. And there could be some backlash too at some point, right? As people maybe start to come back into the office a little bit more. Let, let me just uh, ask Ryan, just to, to segue to that, just before we wrap up, you'd mentioned earlier about um, cities uh, with regards to their occupancies downtown, the tax rates, the commercial uh, impact, uh, good and bad, if they're not uh, productive buildings, paying rates downtown. Do you think cities have thought this through, the consequences of having hollowed out uh, commercial cores? The short answer to that is no, they haven't thought about it enough, but they're starting to pretty quickly after what's happened over the last few years. And, and this is where I think our industry, almost dovetailing with another answer, can probably work with municipal leaders on thinking through some of this stuff. Because I do think um, they're, the, the the classic arguments for cities existing haven't been invalidated, right? Urbanization economies of scale, localization economies of scale, all of those things have not been invalidated by what's occurred over the last few years. Does the space need to change? Almost certainly. The composition probably needs to change the way that we utilize and think about space, the way that we utilize and think about thoroughfares and green spaces. We need a, a massive rethink of all of this. And I think that's where we can we can do a lot of good as as you know the, the expert voices in the room on this. So I would say 
they hadn't thought about this enough. They're starting to try to catch up pretty quickly and we could play a very important role in that education process and helping them figure out what the next, uh, the next evolution of, of cities is going to look like. That's the uh, perfect place to end because we talk about ourselves being problem solvers, being hard data people. Uh, there's so much talent in the commercial real estate uh, sector, counselors and beyond. And I think you're right, uh, Ryan, we have to be at these tables going on going forward. I'd like to thank uh, Victor, Emmy, and Ryan for just an outstanding presentation today. So much candor, so much expertise, so much great opinions for us to consider. Uh, we can't thank you enough for being our guest today. On-demand recordings are available for most What's Next webinars, including today's. Please look for announcements of upcoming sessions this summer, including the highly anticipated the return of the Counselors Economic Advisory Council for a special presentation on June 8th. So you can get more Victor at that point. Uh, um, until then, on behalf of the Counselors of Real Estate, thank you very, very much for attending this session of What's Next for Real Estate and the Life Experience. We're very proud to share this information with our members and the public at large. And again, to the panelists and Victor, thank you so much for teaching us. Everybody have a good day. Goodbye.